Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we continue our study based in Revelation 20 of the 1,000 year kingdom of Jesus Christ. In this study titled Animal Sacrifice in the Millennium, we will see that this is clearly prophesied and there is some fascinating information surrounding this future reality. We would also like to remind you that this is part of our full and complete study of the book of Revelation as we've gone verse by verse from chapter 1, verse 1, and are now coming to the final chapters of the beginning of our eternal future with Jesus Christ. You can find these studies provided in a YouTube playlist and in sermon audio series playlists. Uh, links to these uh, separate playlists can be found at bbfohio.com. And you will also hear these messages by visiting our 24-7 internet radio station at bbfohioradio.com. We also invite correspondence. You can send by email to bbbfohio at yahoo.com or by letter to P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. And now we begin our study based in Revelation chapter 20. This study is titled, Animal Sacrifice in the Millennium, and this is part one of two. Never had a problem. So we're going to be in, uh, well, we're not actually going to be in Revelation 20. That's our base of study that we're, we're looking at the millennium. And so we're going to uh, be studying animal sacrifice during the millennium. And uh, it's a very interesting study, so don't fall asleep on me. But let's go ahead and get started. And we'll open with a prayer, word of prayer. And... I ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time in your word that we're able to open up your book. And Lord, this is uh, some incredible study that we, we're going to go through here. Everything in your book is worth studying. Amen. And uh, we're just thankful for the opportunity. May the Holy Spirit guide us. May everyone in this room um, pay attention to your word. Amen. And uh, we, we are, we're all growing. We're all learning. Amen. We're in this together with your help. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to do something real quick because I don't want to hear this dinging noise the whole time I'm teaching. There we go. Social media let me know that I'm loved. Aww. Or hated. <laughs> All right, animal sacrifice during the millennium. This is a little uh, drawing that someone did of the... Um, Millennial uh, Temple, and uh, you know, you, it, you, it's like anything else. We can't really do it justice, but when you get a little bit of a visual, sometimes it helps. But in the millennium, um, or as in regards to the doctrine of the millennium, um, let's start by saying that's your future if you're saved. Amen. And so it ought to be important to you. It's like uh, Jenny and I are looking. We're uh, wanting to move into a house that's a little better for us uh, financially, get out un underneath some of these taxes, property taxes and things, and help us getting preparing for retirement. And then so we look at these houses, and we look at the details, and people get real excited about that stuff. You know, when it comes to buying a house, buying a car, I've seen guys get the book out and just read all about the car they're about ready to buy and everything. And that's exciting because they're getting ready to have that car. They're getting ready to buy that car. They're getting ready to buy that house. But you know, you're only going to have that thing for a few years. Amen, brother. What we're talking about, we're looking at the book and we're seeing our future. <laughs> and it's going to be the first thousand years after we've gone through the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper, and then this thing thousand years is the first thousand years of the rest of your eternal existence. Amen. It's exciting. But there are two controversial topics, and I put it in quotes, you'll see why in a minute, among premillennialists. Now, a premillennialist, just so you know, is someone who believes that there is actually going to be a kingdom on earth. Believe it or not, even though the Bible seems very clear on it, theologians and scholars have always made a mess of the Bible. And they love to teach people not to believe what it plainly says. And so they come up with this all millennial and post millennial nonsense that says there's either no millennium, it's just spiritual and it's just figurative, or that we're all going to conquer the world. And at the end of a thousand years of conquering the world and having a world that's totally Christian, then Jesus is going to return at the end and say, 
Good going, guys. <laughs> that really is what it is. Nothing like that in Scripture. Amen. The Bible teaches premillennial, meaning that Jesus is going to come before that thousand years, and He's going to reign, and we're going to rule and reign with Him. That's all premillennialism means. Big word, premillennial. And it just means you and I are looking for that future when Jesus returns and establishes His kingdom. But the idea of there being a temple and the idea of animal sacrifice, wow. even among premillennialists, somehow gives them problems. Now, there's no controversy with Bible believers. We just believe it. Amen. 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 That's why we call ourselves Bible believers. We believe what the Bible says. And I know that sounds oversimplistic, but let me tell you something. As a Christian, Satan is going to do everything he can to pull you away from that kind of simple childlike faith Amen. in the Word of God. Yeah. He can use people, relationships, yeah. troubles in your life, financial difficulties, health issues, or he can just make you believe you shouldn't believe what you're reading. Either way, he is, if he does that, he succeeds in pulling you away from the Word of God. Yeah, right. This temple will be built by the Messiah of Israel. Think of this. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. All right. What was Jesus? Jesus. And he's going to build the temple. <laughs> and what did he say? Yeah. It says I am, but I'm not going to worry about it. You know, you all are first in my life. Amen. Hey, preach that. Preach that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, we preserve. Huh? What if the online is They don't, so don't worry about it. <laughs> But you think about it, Jesus the carpenter, what did He say? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. And He's talking about your home. We're going to see that. He's right now building New Jerusalem. Amen. Personally, I think He's about done. Amen. 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 And when He returns, He's going to build a holy city with a temple. That's right. Zechariah 6.12 says this, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. We talked about that last week. The branch is a reference to the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. And he shall grow up out of his place, and, look what it says, he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now watch this. See that little thing there? What is that? Is that what they call that? Comma? That represents... 2,000 years. Amen. You think of that? Amen. What's going on? Oh. You guys aren't paying attention in the back. You're missing something. <laughs> this is more important than Charlie. <laughs> yeah. You see this thing here? What is that in the back? All right, you boys in school, you better know this. What is this thing I'm pointing at? It's a comma? That comma separates this and this. It represents 2,000 years. Amen. Jesus grew up out of His place, didn't He? Yes, sir. But then they crucified Him. Yes, sir. He was buried, but He rose again. Amen? Amen. Then He ascended to heaven, and the angel said, This one will return just as you see Him Amen, that's right. ascend. And when He returns, where did He leave from when He ascended? Come on, Bible students. Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives. Give that boy a cracker. Boy a cracker. <laughs> where is He going to return when He returns? Where is He going to land? The Mount of Olives. Next time you read the book of Acts and you see Jesus ascending from the Mount of Olives, you should remember that's where He's going to return. And when He returns, the Bible says He's going to split the Mount of Olives in two. Amen. Right. And it's just going to cause an earthquake and rip right up through the city. Amen. And it's going to open that wall that the Muslims have concreted up so they think they're going to stop the Messiah from walking through. Yeah. You realize that? Yeah. The reason that eastern gate in Jerusalem is concreted up is because they thought they could stop the Messiah. Wow. 
And he could have just said, you know, boys, take some sledgehammers and knock through that. But instead, he's going to do this. Wow. And then he's going to walk right through. <laughs> this millennial temple will be the seventh. How many of you heard that before? No. Seven temples. Okay. Number one, there's a heavenly temple. Amen. And that's the pattern for the rest. Amen. Hebrews 9.23, if you want to look it up. Then came the Mosaic Tabernacle. Yes. Exodus 26.1. Then came Solomon's temple, 1 Chronicles 6.10. Then is Herod's temple, the one that Jesus ministered around. Matthew 21.12. Then Jesus' body, tear down this temple, and I will raise it up again on the third day. John 2.19. Then is coming the tribulation temple that they've already got ready to build. And that's 2 Thessalonians 2.4. And finally will be the millennial temple, which you can read about in Ezekiel 40-48. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but a lot of Christians have either skipped or slept through that. And the reason why is they don't realize one of these days you're going to see it. Yeah. And the, once you realize you're going to see that thing, then you start paying attention and start to think. Now, it's not easy to figure it all out, but with the help of teachers and, and commentaries and good commentaries, I mean good Bible study Bibles, and even some charts and things like that, you really start to get a picture of this thing. Now, there are seven temples, but most Bible teachers refer to this as the fourth. That's what most of you have heard, right? Right? Mm -hmm. The fourth temple is the millennial temple. And they're thinking strictly in terms of earthly temples on the temple mount, see? But the thing is, this temple is so huge, it will actually not be on the temple mount. This fourth one, as they call it. But that's how you'd see the list most of the time. They'll refer to it as four temples, Solomon's, Herod's, Tribulation, millennial. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying that they're looking at it just as earthly temples on the Temple Mount where I believe it rep is representative of seven temples. Amen. That's why I say this is the seventh. Amen. And it's just this is the way God does things. Amen. Sevens. Amen. <laughs> so when you, you look at this list and you think about it, God does things in sevens and you would have just expected Him to have seven temples. Amen. And you don't have to make it up. It's right there. And that's why I gave you the references Amen. so that you can look that up. And if you don't have time to write it all down, you can do snapshots. That's what Jenny does. She takes a snapshot of it and then she can look at it later. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, the younger generation. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 45. Ezekiel chapter 45. Ezekiel 40 through 48 is uh, a lot of great information regarding this, what we're studying. But in Ezekiel chapter 45, we're going to see um, specifics. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Moreover, when ye shall divide the lot uh, by lot the land for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord and holy portion of the land. So, uh, first of all, what you see, even, even the land that you saw in the Old Testament, they never took the whole thing. Yeah. A lot of people claim, well, God's not going to put Israel back in the land. He's already given them the lamb. He fulfilled His promises. It's over. No, wrong. God did His parts insofar as He could, but because of the Jews not obeying Him, yeah. they never did get the whole land, the whole land mass. In another study we'll look more at that, we've done it before. And in that land mass, it will be distributed among the tribes, and one of those will be for the priesthood and the temple. Now, this temple that is the whole, uh, this holy portion is much bigger than the present temple mount. And even the area that we'll see just for the temple is much bigger than what we call the, the uh, temple mount today. Continues verse 1, The length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds, and the breadth shall be ten thousand. This shall be holy in all the borders thereof round about. Now, for the sake of time, we're not going to go into detail, but we'll come back to that in just a second. 
that says, Of this there shall be for the sanctuary, that's the actual temple, um, the actual inner temple, uh, with 500, it has the, the holy place and the most holy place and all, all that entailed in that. But we're going to see, I'm going to show you a little clip here. Uh, it says, uh, uh, the sanctuary is 500 in length with 500 in breadth, square roundabout, and 50 cubits roundabout for the suburbs thereof. And we all know what suburbs are. The area of the temple courts is one square mile. Wow. That's big. I mean, that's big. That's bigger than the city today. But keep in mind that what you're, you're looking at is the millennium where the whole world is now healed and there are no uh, like deserts like Saudi Arabia anymore. And so, uh, and, and the whole amount of land that's promised to Israel will belong to Israel. And so they not only do they uh, have a, a bigger area for their temple and the Levites, but they have a massively bigger country than what you see today when you look at a map of Israel. Now there's kind of a artist representation of just the temple area. And that would uh, be, you know, about like this big in the tribulation temple compared to this. And notice, we're not going to go into this, but this water. It's an amazing thing about this water. It starts out just as a small stream and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then goes down to the Dead Sea, what, as we call it the Dead Sea, mm -hmm. but it will heal the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea will be lush with life. And from there it will feed all the waters of the world. Wow. Starting from the temple. Mm -hmm. So the holy portion that we talked about is for priesthood dwellings. It's like where the priests will live, the tribe of Levi. And it's 40 by 50 miles. Wow. 2,000 square miles. Now, you want an idea of how big that is? Go to the Adirondacks. And just walk around for a little while. If you go to, it's approximately 2,000 square miles. And that just as the Adirondacks is only a portion of the state of New York, yeah. so this area we're talking about is only a portion of the nation of Israel during the kingdom. But that's how big it is. And uh, my brother used to live up there, and we've been up there a couple of times. Beautiful area, and huge area. People get lost and are never heard of <laughs> from again if they're not careful in that area. That's how big this is. Now here comes the hard part. Believing the text. That, that's just that's the hard part. It, now you say that's not hard. Well, then you're going to have an easy time. But that is what causes people, and I have people, and I, I want to be careful to not say this in a way that sounds like I'm putting them down, um, you know, but it's, it's amazing how many people contact me and their question isn't really a question other than, is that really what it means? And there's times where they see these things in the Bible and they're just like, I, that's hard for me to believe. But you know, what we have to do is trust God. You read the Bible and you just see, is that really what it says? And if that's what it says, guess what? That's what it means. That's another t-shirt, another bumper sticker. All right, let's try this again. How many of you heard of Zola Levitt? The what? Zola Levitt? How many of you heard of Zola Levitt? A few of you? He's with the Lord now. And this is a little video clip from one of his programs. The book of Ezekiel speaks of yet another temple, a fourth temple for the kingdom age. John Schmidt of the Messianic Temple Ministries has built a very detailed scale model based on the temple dimensions as given by Ezekiel. He finds some interesting differences, however, between this particular temple and the previous temples. All of Israel's previous temples have had a wall that has gone around the area between the outer court and the inner court. It has a wall of about three feet high with openings in it. This wall is called the wall of partition. At each of the openings in the wall is a sign. And on this sign it says, 
any Gentile found beyond this sign will be himself responsible for his own death. This wall is not here. Did Ezekiel make a mistake in leaving it out? Or is there a reason it is gone? The answer to that question, John believes, can be found in the book of Ephesians. Jesus hath made both one, Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now we come to the temple building itself. This is the center of all the temple structures. The reason that everything else on this model and in the temple exists is for this building. Let's go with this priest inside and see what Ezekiel tells us about the interior of this temple. Here we have a cutaway of the interior of the model and the way Ezekiel would have maybe seen it. What we would normally expect to find in a temple is something like this, with the table of showbread, the candlestick, the golden altar before a veil, and the mercy seat. Ezekiel saw none of these things. He did not see the candlestick. Nor did he see the table of showbread. Nor did he see the golden altar. Instead, he saw a tall wooden table before a door, not a veil, into the Holy of Holies. And what did he see in the Holy of Holies? In Ezekiel chapter 43, Ezekiel is told this. He was not allowed into that room, but he heard a voice from in that room say, Son of man, the place of the soles of my feet and the place of my throne where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall they no more defile. The candlestick, the showbread, the altar, veil, and mercy seat are all beautiful symbols of Christ, but they're all missing. They're missing, as John explains, because of the presence of Messiah himself. There is no need for pictures of the king when he himself rules from the throne room. going to see that one of these days Amen. and Jesus is going to be seated on a throne. Amen. That's awesome. Now several prophets foretold of animal sacrifice during the Messianic kingdom. And this is another thing that's hard for people to get. Isaiah foretold of this in Isaiah 56, 6. And the sons of the stranger, that's talking about how that there's going to be this access of Gentiles. The sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of My covenant. Now remember, this is during the millennium and the Sabbath will be in effect. Verse 7, Even them will I bring to My holy mountain, and that's what we were just looking at, what's on that mountain, and make them joyful in My house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Wow. You're going to have these sacrifices taking place around and outside of this area that we just saw where Jesus and his throne is located. Again, in Isaiah 60, verse 7, And all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, the rams of the Nebaioth, shall minister unto thee and all this what is he talking about flocks he's talking about rams they shall come up with acceptance on mine altar and I will glorify the house of my glory um, another prophet that talked about these sacrifices with Jeremiah now I want you to imagine how many of you have uh, have ever been to city barbecue been there you know one of the best things about going to City Barbecue is parking. Because no. you pull in 
and you can start to smell that. And you're like, oh, can you smell that? And then you get out of the car and it's even stronger. You're like, oh, that just smells so good. And I'm not joking when I tell you this. Throughout the Bible, it says that God smells the smell of those sacrifices on burnt offering sacrifices as a sweet savor. And when you go to a city barbecue, give them some free advertisement here, they probably won't give me a kickback, but you know, in any of these places where they, they open grill and all that, and you smell that, that is what God smells, a sweet savor. And that's what I believe added to the atmosphere when everybody would come to Jerusalem for these feasts. As they're approaching Jerusalem, they're smelling all oh, that grill. <laughs> mm, can you smell that? Oh, and they'd get in, and they'd be excited about all this food they were going to eat because they don't throw those animals away, folks. They ate them, mm -hmm. and that's what's going to be going on in the millennium. And so you read these, like Jeremiah thirty-three seventeen. For thus saith the Lord: David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. Jeremiah's talking about that millennial kingdom. And they're always going to be there offering those sacrifices. And now, just so you know, a lot of you might be asking or thinking this, you might think of it later, so I'll save you a little heartache. You're going to be glorified. You're going to be in a glorified condition. But if you read carefully, Jesus in His glorified condition eats. And He doesn't lose His sense of smell. And He's going to enjoy this just as much as you and I will. But we're going to be there enjoying it. Amen. I've had people say, do you think we'll be able to eat hamburgers in the millennium? I said, probably not because we'd be too busy eating steak. <laughs> now, that's only for the Bible believer. The rest of anybody else don't believe it, then don't believe it. You just, you just believe you're going to go through, I don't know what you think you're going to eat for eternity, Pop-Tarts. Another prophet was Zechariah. Zechariah 14, 16, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. And what? To keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And verse 17, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So you've got to come up and offer sacrifice. And if you don't, you get a drought. Wow. <laughs> Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt, he always, he, it's something about Egypt, he kind of points them out, makes them the example in these prophecies. And if the family of Egypt go up, not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague. So if a drought isn't enough to get you up there, there'll be a plague. Wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to the Feast of, the ta of Tabernacles. Verse 19, This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In verse 20, and For solid King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com.